Hello, this is Bishop Michael Ryan of the Allegheny Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We thank you for joining us today. On November 22nd, 1970, Pastor Elizabeth Platts became the first woman ordained to be a pastor in the Lutheran Church in the United States. Pastor Platts was called to serve as campus pastor to the University of Maryland and was ordained by the Maryland Synod of the Lutheran Church in America. Today, we celebrate 50 years of the church getting it right. Led by the Holy Spirit, the Lutheran Church in this country was led to finally acknowledge the gifts and skills of our sisters in Christ, and that Christ Jesus, the same Lord who sent Mary Magdalene to spread the good news of his resurrection to be the apostle to the apostles, had called these sisters to be ministers of word and sacrament. In the Allegheny Synod, we have been so very blessed by the ministry of our pastors who are female, and we thank God for these colleagues and for all the gifts they bring and the way they share their ministry with us. Now, in the 1980s and 1990s, the Allegheny Synod had the most pastors who were female in the ELCA. Today, we no longer lead the ELCA, but we tend to hover around a 50% split between our female and male pastors in the Synod. What I'm saying is the Allegheny Synod could not do ministry without these colleagues. So I thank God for our pastors who are female. I thank God for their leadership, for their proclamation of the gospel, their care for God's people, their contributions to the church and to their communities, and the way they point to Christ with all of their lives, and for the many, many ways that they bless us. Now, we had hoped that we would be able to gather in person to celebrate this, this major milestone in our church. However, the continuing pandemic has made, us, made it not safe for us to gather together at this time. But there are many people who we need to thank to have made this service happen and brought this digital service together. We thank uh, all the members of our 50th anniversary committee for all their hard work through the last year getting ready for this celebration. We thank Mrs. Laurel Sanders and all, the, all of her choir at uh, Grace and State College, the digital choir she put together, who will be sharing their gifts with us today. We thank uh, Mr. Ryan Custad, who has been our editor and who has assembled the service for us. We have been blessed by all of their service. I pray that we all may be blessed as we worship together this day. May we know the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ among us. Again, we thank God for these pastors who are female here in the Allegheny Synod and all across the ELCA and across the world. And please, do me a favor. You will encounter our pastors who are female in your congregations or out in our synod. Take the time to thank them. Thank them for their service. Thank them for the way they share the gospel with us. And thank them for the way they are a witness to God's grace and light working here in the Allegheny Synod. May God bless you now and always.
Together, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Loving God, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds are an open book to you. You have seen where we fall short. You know where we have strayed as individuals and as your church. In your mercy, forgive us and guide us into right ways of being, ways of welcome, paths of mercy, habits of grace, so that we may live renewed in the joy of our salvation, prepared, equipped, and ready to meet Christ in our neighbors and in your creation. Amen. God's ways are not our ways, and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Before we were made, God brought creation out of nothing and peace out of chaos. In this same love, God unyokes you from sin and binds you to a new life and new living in Jesus Christ. Rejoice and be glad. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. For the vocations of pastor, deacon, and bishop, for those who lead churches and faith communities, for those whose life work is evangelical witness in word and deed, we, we rejoice, rejoice and, and give, give thanks, thanks to, to God. God. For 50 years of women's ordination in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and its predecessor bodies, we, we rejoice, rejoice and, and give, give thanks, thanks to, to God. God. For the women of color who have been called by God to serve this church, we, we rejoice, rejoice and give thanks, thanks to God. God. For the faithful service of LGBTQIA pastors who have enriched this church, and for the 10 years since the policy change enabling them to serve publicly out and in partnered relationships, we rejoice, rejoice and, and give, give thanks, thanks to God. God. For the work of seminary professors and staff, chaplains and administrators, those who work for nonprofits, and those who are retired from paid ministries, we, we rejoice, rejoice and, and give, give thanks, thanks to God. God. For those who are discerning a call to serve Christ's church, for those who are in candidacy, and for those in their internship congregations, we, we rejoice, rejoice and, and give, give thanks, thanks to God. God. For the witness of Mary Magdalene, the dance of Miriam, the hospitality of Lydia, the prayer of Mary, the discernment of Deborah, the courage of Rahab, and the faithfulness of our biblical foremothers, we, we rejoice, rejoice and, and give thanks, thanks to God. For witness of women in, in this church and throughout the Allegheny Synod, including the women who serve as rostered leaders who have shaped our lives and our faith, including those whom we name here in our hearts or on our lips. For all God's faithful servants, we rejoice and, and give, give thanks, thanks to God. God. Gracious and living God, we rejoice and give you thanks for your power on display throughout time and place, calling all kinds of people to be witnesses to your grace and power. We celebrate how the Spirit has blessed your church through the work of women and girls, including in this time and place. Guide us as your people into welcoming your prophets and teachers among us 
in hearing Christ's good news through them. With gratitude we pray. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Most high God, you know our whole truth, and you give us refuge in the shadow of your wings. Continue to raise up girls and women to serve Christ's church and strengthen all in the vocations to which you call us. At the last, gather us with Miriam and the saints to dance on the safe side of the sea. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The lesson is a reading from Exodus chapter 15. 
When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The word of the Lord. Our psalm is from Psalm 57. I invite you to read responsively. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass by. I cry to God most high, to God who fulfills God's promises for me. God will send from heaven and save me. God will put to shame those who trample on me. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my soul. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. The second reading is taken from Galatians, the third chapter. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying 
one at the head and the other at the foot. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I wonder what Mary of Magdala would think of us today. I realized as I was preparing this that I really knew very, very little about her. And so I looked her up. And what I found was a little surprising because I suppose over the years I have accepted what the church has rather readily accepted about this Mary. Magdala, of course, was her hometown, but we've used it as her last name, that I knew. But it wasn't until the fifth century that the church finally decided what to do about this woman, this woman who had played such an important part in the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And of course, the church by the fifth century had many of the same troubles that we have today. Those things don't change even over the centuries. And so they decided at that time that she was Mary of Magdala, but the Mary, the woman who was in earlier times called the prostitute. And that title, of course, has followed her now through the centuries, so that most people, I imagine, think of her in that way as her identification. It turns out there really is no way of, of tying her to that title. Uh, it's something that got attached to her and probably it's well past the time when it should be given up because there's something much, much more important about Mary of Magdala that we need to remember. The one thing we know for sure about her without any research at all is that she was the first to proclaim the good news of the resurrection. And that is a precious gift that she's given to us in this time. And as a woman who's been standing in the pulpit for 40 years, I am grateful, very grateful, for her faithfulness. She went and told the good news, the truth, to a community that was huddled in fear and bringing that news was something that cannot and should not be forgotten. At this point, I want to share my perspective on it a bit, if you'll forgive me, the personal notes here. I came from a group many, many years ago that did not and does not ordain women. And so, of course, even though I was hungry to learn more, it wasn't until I ended up in a little town called Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and there was a pastor there who was fairly newly graduated from his seminary and eager to share what he had learned there. So he offered an adult Bible study, as so many of us do. Two people came, the pastor's wife and me. I did not realize at the time what the problem was. I was glad that he was offering it. But you see, she was known about town as 
his, well, his Mexican wife. Uh, Eulalia was Spanish and in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in the late 1950s, that made her an outsider, someone to be looked at with a certain amount of scorn. I did not understand until many years later why Pastor Roy Stoll's tenure there was as short as it was, but it was very uncomfortable for the two of them to be there as a couple. But of course, the gift to me was that he offered a Bible study. And he came from a seminary that had taught him very, very well, and my hunger grew and grew. There wasn't much I could do about it after he and Eulalia left Hattiesburg, but many, many years later, I was reading one day Time Magazine. Now this was the April 15th 1972 issue of April of uh, Time magazine and there was a little box that noted that in 1970 the American Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church in America had begun ordaining women I was struck as by lightning because I'd never heard of that for two years, my own church body had not bothered to make that public. I still remember strolling around the house, couldn't stop. And the only thing it said to me at that time was, if they're ordaining women, they must be letting them in the seminary. I could go to seminary and continue to learn those wonderful things that Pastor Stoll had started to teach. And so over the next few years, I managed to somehow arrange my life, my church membership and all those things so that I would end up going to the seminary. I went, however, simply as a scholar. It still did not enter my mind that ordination might be something I was after. It was that first quarter of clinical pastoral education that I did in a hospital that finally told me why all this was going on. So finally, in 1980, I was ordained. Now I'm well aware that this came to me as a gift. I did not have to fight for it. I did not have to earn it in any way. It was simply there waiting for me. I was not part of the struggle, and I know that. And I am grateful to all those women who over the years did struggle until they could be part of the ministry of the church. Grateful for those who simply persevered. When I did become an ordained pastor in 1980, I sometimes found them to be somewhat angry and I didn't understand it. Now I do, now I do. It had been a struggle. But for me, it was simply a gift waiting to be taken advantage of, which I did. I answered my call. As I said, I had to leave my beloved church body at that point to do that. And yet, I am well aware of what I left behind. I often think of my sisters who still do not have that privilege that I have and have had for 40 years, who are still struggling because they're doing ministry. They are just not recognized by their church body in the way that I am. A friend of mine who decided to stay and to be an example of how women can minister in the church was fond of wearing a red jacket, and somebody said to her one day, uh, why do you always wear red? And she answered with a sort of wry sense of humor, I'm into martyrdom. Perhaps not literally, but then she achieved a national church position. It actually turned out to be the one that I ended up with in my own denomination. 
She didn't keep it very long, however, because the powers that be decided that that position gave her authority over men and could not be allowed. She still maintains her membership. She still stands as an example of a woman who can do that kind of ministry, even if the powers that be frown on her. She is a living example of competence in ministry in a hostile place. And I pray for her all the time. But to go back to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which welcomed me, even though I, I don't suppose I appreciated at the time all that had gone into the struggle, is the ELCA perfect? Well, no, of course not. Does everyone agree, even in this day, that women should be pastors? No. Does everyone in the ELC agree on anything? No, of course not. We are part of a living church that lives in this world. As we minister each Sunday and, and stand in a pulpit and preach, we are very aware that we are talking to people that do not agree with us politically, socially, in many ways. But we also know that we are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all these people with their varying positions may come together, may come together and worship the Lord. In 2,000 years, the issues over which we can differ have certainly changed, and in the years to come, they will change again. But we who are called into this kind of ministry are also called to rise above that, to preach the good news that our Lord, who was crucified, has risen, and that we are forgiven no matter where we stand on what current issue there might be. I had an opportunity recently to work in this synod with someone I did not realize necessarily differed from me. We were working with a troubled congregation as part of a team. And one evening he simply stood up and said, well, Pastor Simonson belongs to this political party and I belong to that one. And she believes this and I believe that. But we are here to help you. I'm afraid I sat there and simply laughed because it was so true, it was so wonderful. And I have since thanked him. We don't have to agree on a lot of things. But that example that was set by Mary of Magdala still shines and it cannot be ignored because 2,000 years or so later, her message still endures. That's the one thing that lasts in this changing world. And she was the first to speak up with courage. I'm sure she was not believed either in some quarters, obviously, but she spoke and she told the truth. And we are all, all in this day and time, women and men alike, blessed to proclaim, as she did, Christ is risen. Amen.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ received you and made you members of his church. In the community of God's people, you have learned from God's word, God's loving purpose for you and all creation. You have been nourished at the Lord's holy table and called to be witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Therefore, I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. God of grace, Draw your church together and break down divisions among us. Guide our leaders, especially women who serve as bishops, pastors, and deacons, and those who continue to work for equality and equity in your church. Use each of your gifted servants to proclaim your good news for all people throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, you created humankind in your image and gave us dominion over what you had made. Renew and restore the earth. Use our hands to tend to the land and care for your beloved creatures, making us good stewards of all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of miracles, people around the world cry out for justice. Inspire world leaders to enact policies that serve the good of all. Lift up those who are vulnerable or treated as unequal, especially women and girls who still fight for rights, education, and opportunity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, tend to those in the deepest need. Feed the hungry, heal the sick, Provide for those who seek shelter and other basic needs. Comfort the lonely and the grieving. Remind us that you are with us always and in all circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, show us your ways. Bless the congregations and parishes of the Allegheny Synod. Guide the ministries that we are called to. Equip us for service in our communities and renew our zeal for loving our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all times and places, the many saints who came before us have paved a path of faithfulness and shown us the way to follow you. 
give us grateful hearts as we remember the women who have nurtured us in faith and keep us in communion with all of your saints until the day when we feast together at your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have blessed us with our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our communities, and the resources of this earth. Lead us and guide us to use these gifts in accordance with your will. For the sake of the one who is with us to the end, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the joy of God's freedom cause your spirit to dance. May the presence of God's peace bring wholeness to your body and mind. May God give you blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. In the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us this evening. We thank God for you, and we thank God for all those who have given their time and energy to make this evening possible. May God be with you. And now, may we go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.